You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. We're in Acts chapter 10, looking at this meeting between Cornelius and Peter, and I have been struck by the amount of space that Luke has given to this one incident. Doesn't it strike you as odd that he would spend basically two in chapter, two entire, entire chapters giving to us the details of Peter and Cornelius and their meeting and the results of that meeting? In a book that spans a time span of 30 years, Luke devotes two chapters out of 28, a tremendous amount of text, to this one incident. To put it into perspective, Luke gives us more information about Cornelius and what happened with him and between him and Peter than he does about the day of Pentecost. He gives us more information about this incident than he does about the ascension of Christ. Tremendous amount of detail, tremendous amount of text that he turns over to this one incident. He spends more time talking about Cornelius' conversion than he does the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And Paul is the hero of this book. You and I are to understand that this is an incredibly significant event in the history of the church. Uh, Luke has devoted two entire chapters out of this book to an event that takes place over just a couple of days. It is like he just wants time to stand still for a second so that you and I can understand all of the details that happened in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 surrounding the conversion of this one man and his household and and really the crowd with him. But the focus of it is on Cornelius. A lot of detail, a lot of time that Luke spends on it. And it's for a good reason because really Acts 10 and Acts 11 lay the foundation for the rest of the book. You see, Luke in chapters 13 through 28 is going to unfold for us the Gentile mission. The Gospel going to Gentile cities, Gentile churches, Gentile peoples. And it all comes back to Acts 10 and Acts 11. We've seen the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, commissioned to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And now the question is, when Paul begins his ministry and starts preaching Christ among the Gentiles, how is this going to be received back in Jerusalem by the other apostles? Are they going to endorse His ministry? Are they going to accept His ministry? Are they going to see it as valid? Or will there continue to be this wall between Jews and Gentiles? And will the other apostles in Jerusalem just say, that's Paul, he's the Gentile guy, that's all his thing. We've got our Jewish church. And then allow Paul on the other side of the divide to say, well, we're the Gentiles, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, we're the Gentile church. So you had a Jewish church and a Gentile church. Was that going to happen? Or would the apostles come to understand that there was to be one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all? And that there would be no Jew, no Gentile, no distinction, no wall, none of this stuff that separates us. Were they going to accept that? Well, God was going to have to do some supernatural and phenomenal things to get these racial Jews to accept Gentiles. And we've looked at some of the phenomenal stuff that he's done. I mean, the vision to Peter, the sheet with all the animals and I've never eaten anything unclean. Peter, don't call it unclean. There are things that I've cleansed that I don't consider unclean, and you shouldn't either. Well, Peter gets the message from the vision. Cornelius has a vision. Those are two phenomenal things, but the Lord's not done. You see, somebody could look at Peter's vision and say, well, he was hungry, he was on the roof, he was smelling the food. That's why he had the vision. It was not of the Lord. It was just the product of his hunger that created this dream, this trance state that Peter went into. He was starving to death. And somebody might write that off as not being of the Lord. And then somebody might write off Cornelius' vision as saying, well, Cornelius was a pagan. He wasn't saved. So why would the Lord appear to him? And he's a Gentile. You can't trust those lesser breed Gentiles anyway. But the Lord was going to do something that nobody would be able to deny that this was God's will for Gentiles to come into the church. There's one more supernatural, phenomenal event that's going to happen that is going to demonstrate to everybody once and for all that Jew and Gentile are the same in the sight of God. What is that one thing? Tongues. Now how long has it been since we talked about tongues? 
See, it wasn't in Acts 9, was it? It wasn't in Acts 8. The 7 was Stephen's sermon. 6 was the commissioning of the deacons. 5 was Peter before the Sanhedrin. 4 was Peter before the Sanhedrin. 3 was the healing of the beggar. That was clear back in chapter 2, wasn't it? All the way back in chapter 2. Chronologically speaking, in the book of Acts, the last time tongues occurred was five or six years prior to this event with Cornelius. So you're looking at a gap of about five or six years where Luke doesn't even mention that it happened. But now it happens with Cornelius. And so we got to ask the question, what in the world is going on that when Cornelius gets saved, he begins to speak in tongues? Why does the Lord manifest tongues at this point in the narrative, in, in the history of the church? What made Cornelius unique? Why is this here and what's going on? Well, we're going to deal with that as we look at sort of the two results to Peter's sermon to Cornelius and to this whole household. There's two things that result. We'll deal with tongues as it relates to the first thing, which was belief. Two results to Peter's from Peter's sermon before Cornelius. The first is belief. Peter has given a very straightforward, very simple presentation of the Gospel. He's gone through just the basic Gospel facts. No long dealing with Old Testament texts or Old Testament prophets. Peter has basically said, here's who Christ is. Here's what Christ did. Here's why you need Him. And here's how you receive Him. And he goes through all of that. And you'll notice in chapter 10, verse 44, that the Lord interrupts Peter's sermon. Look at verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the message and were listening to the message. While Peter was still speaking these things, Peter's in mid-sentence. You say he's given everything that is necessary for Cornelius to be saved. You're right, he has. Look over at chapter 11, verse 15. Peter's back and he's reporting to the rest of the apostles in Jerusalem. Look what he says. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as just as He did upon us at the beginning. I was just getting started, Peter said. The Lord interrupted his sermon and these Gentiles have the audacity to get saved before Peter even has a chance to really give them an invitation to come forward. And they get saved. And his sermon is interrupted. He's just getting warmed up. This is his introduction. He's maybe just laying out the outline like I kind of do to you sometimes in the introduction. And right in the middle of his sermon, this thing happens. Peter says, I was just beginning to speak and the Spirit of God came upon them. He hasn't even gotten to point one of his... Five-point sermon yet. And it is frustrating when the Lord decides to interrupt a sermon. Do you remember a couple years ago we have our Easter service here and the fire alarm went off? You remember that? It wasn't even during the service. It was during the sermon. If it had been during the service, then that would have been fine. I could have taken that sermon and put it off till next year and we could have all gone home. But I had preached just enough of a sermon that if I ever preached it again, you would know. But I hadn't preached enough of the sermon to actually get to the point that the whole sermon was driving toward. So it got cut off right in the middle and I agonized over that for a week. Lord, what are you doing? Why would you do such a thing? For a week I agonized over that. Terrible. Terribly frustrating. But I'd go nuts if I didn't believe God was sovereign. For whatever reason He did it, He did it. And the alarm went off. Peter is just getting started and the alarm goes off, so to speak. And he says, while he was speaking these words, the Spirit of God fell upon these Gentile believers. That is to say that they get saved. Because to have the presence of the Spirit of God is to be saved. He who is without the Spirit doesn't know Christ, doesn't belong to Christ. So although Luke doesn't say that Cornelius believed, that's the implication of what he's saying. They received the Spirit. The Spirit of God in the middle of Peter's sermon came down, fell upon these Gentiles, and at that moment they believed. And Cornelius had received just enough information to get saved. Peter had said, here's who Christ is, here's what Christ did, here's why you need Him, and here's how you receive Him. And verse 43, Peter ends with, everybody who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins. That's all Cornelius needs to understand. If I place my faith in Christ, my sins are forgiven. Well, he's been expecting this and waiting for this. There's all of this pent-up expectation. And when the words finally come out of Peter's mouth, here's how you must be saved, Cornelius does it like that. The Spirit of God falls upon him. He places his faith in Christ right in the middle of the sermon. In fact, all of those who were present hearing the message did this. And the Spirit of God came upon them in an act of salvation and they were saved. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And what was it that saved them? They were listening to the song. No. They were listening to the message. The preaching of His Word that saves the soul. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 25, we have been saved not by a perishable seed, but by that seed that's imperishable, the 
pure and undefiled Word of God that does not fade away. And then Peter says, this is the Word that was preached to you. That's how they got saved. That's how people get saved is when the message is proclaimed. James 1.18, in the exercise of His will, He brought us forth. That is, He birthed us by His Word of truth. It's the Word of God that brought salvation. Peter is proclaiming to these Gentiles the Word of God, and the Spirit of God at that moment decides, regardless of what Peter is doing, at the most inconvenient of times for Peter, as far as Peter is concerned, to save these Gentiles, and they trust in Christ. And the Spirit of God comes and saves them. And they place their faith in Christ. And then those six brethren, you remember there are six that came with Peter from Joppa up to Caesarea, and they're there with him? And all of those Jewish brethren, they start rejoicing and boy, they're praising God and aren't they thankful? Is that what happens? No, text says that the uncircumcised brethren, look at verse 45, who came with Peter were amazed. You're kidding me. Can you just picture that? Their mouths are open, they're drooling, their eyes are wide like that, like a deer in the headlights. They're dumbfounded incredulous, speechless. The word that Luke uses actually means they were beside themselves. They cannot even put words to what they're thinking. These Gentiles are receiving salvation. And the Spirit of God is falling upon these Gentiles. And they're amazed at this. They didn't expect this. This was far more than anything they had expected to see. I don't think Peter was all that surprised because you'll notice it says that the uncircumcised brethren who came with Peter were amazed that the Spirit of God had been given to the Gentiles. It doesn't say Peter was amazed. I don't know if Peter expected to see all that he saw here with the tongues and everything, but I don't think Peter was amazed that the Spirit of God would be poured out on Gentiles. Remember, he was there in Acts chapter 8 and he saw the Spirit of God given to the Samaritans, the half-Jew, half-Gentile breed. And now he's seeing it happen with the Gentiles. I think Peter's kind of learned the lesson that God doesn't consider some men unclean. So the fact that the Spirit of God would be given to Gentiles, Peter can stomach that. But these six brethren who come from Joppa, friends, that's more than they can take. They're amazed at this. Why would they be amazed? Well, they're familiar with the Old Testament prophets that predicted that the Spirit of God would be poured out on the nation of Israel. Well, that's them. Not these guys. These guys are the Gentiles. We can understand how God could indwell us and come upon us. I mean, we're Jews. But upon an unclean Gentile? See, they hadn't learned the lesson that God doesn't consider some men unclean. They had yet to learn this. And so they're standing there, and they are absolutely shell-shocked. They cannot believe what they are seeing. To them, it must be a dream. Pinch me. Can this possibly be real? They are beside themselves with amazement at what they see. How is it that they knew that the Spirit of God had been given to the Gentiles? How did they know that? Did they see something? Did they hear something? Look at verse 46. They were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Now we have to pause here to answer the question, what is it that they're doing? Why is this happening? And is this normal? What's going on here? This is obviously something that's somewhat odd. What is this? Is is tongues, is it ecstatic babble, mindless speech, repeated syllables? Or is tongues a language? Do you remember? What is tongues? It's a language, isn't it? Do you remember Acts chapter 2? Luke uses the word glossa, which means a spoken language to describe the phenomenon. In fact, the people who stood by in Acts chapter 2, they were what? Amazed to hear the apostles speaking in tongues. And they said, how is it that we hear these Galileans speaking to us in our own dialectos, our own dialect? Not just the language, but the the pronounced, the specific dialect of those who heard it. In Acts chapter 2, they listened to the apostles speak languages. Now when we get to Acts chapter 10, some people say, well, Acts chapter 2, it's languages, because the language that Luke uses to communicate that is clear, so we can't deny that. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 10, we have something different. We have this ecstatic babble, this, this, this heavenly language, this repetition of syllables that means nothing, blah, 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 that's a tongue that you hear so commonly today. That's what we have in Acts 10. My question would be, why would you assume that? Luke clearly expects for us to understand what's going on in Acts 10 in light of what he's told us back in Acts 2. 
In Acts 2, he's gone to some great lengths to tell us this was languages. Not just languages, but dialects that they were able to speak. Not their mother tongue, just the ability suddenly when the Spirit of God came upon them to exalt and praise God and preach Christ in a language they had never learned. But suddenly they are able to articulate in a dialect to communicate truth to these people who are listening. A phenomenal occurrence. And all those who see it, see it and they understand what the purpose of it is. They understand what the goal of it is. And they trust Christ as a result of seeing all of this. But then when we get to Acts chapter 10, Luke uses the same word to describe the phenomenon that occurs in Acts 10 as he does in Acts 2, and he doesn't indicate to us that it's anything different. So you and I must assume that the tongues in Acts 10 is the same as the tongues in Acts 2, because that's clearly Luke's intention. So what is it going on in Acts chapter 10? It's languages. The Spirit of God comes upon Cornelius, And he begins to speak a language. What language did Cornelius speak? I don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. Perhaps Cornelius began to speak Peter's mother tongue in his dialect. Perhaps Cornelius began to speak the language that Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost. I don't know what language Cornelius and those people spoke, but I can tell you this. Peter understood it to be the same thing as happened in Acts chapter 2. Peter understood it to be the genuine gift of tongues, not ecstatic babble. And Peter understood that it was a language that Cornelius was speaking. You see, Luke goes to great pains to show us that what's happening in Acts 10 is the same as in Acts 2. Look at chapter 10, verse 47 with me. Look at verse 47. Peter says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. Look, just as we did. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 2. And Peter says, they received Him just as we received Him. What event is he talking about? Pentecost. Turn over to Acts chapter 11, verse 15. Peter says, I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as He did upon us when? At the beginning. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as He gave to us. Three times Peter tells us that what is happening in Acts chapter 10 is the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 2. It's not a different phenomenon. It's the same phenomenon. It's of the same nature. Peter's saying, just as we spoke in tongues, they spoke in tongues. Now notice that Peter does not say this. Peter does not say, we saw the Holy Spirit be poured out on the Gentiles and just as it was upon those in Joppa and those in Lydia, and the thousands of others who have accepted Christ since Pentecost. Peter doesn't say that. Peter says, the same has happened on us at the beginning. It's the same nature. What is it that's happening in Acts 10? It's languages. Likely dialects that Cornelius and those who are with him speak that manifest the Spirit of God. Why is this happening? You say the birth of the church was in Acts chapter 2. What do we have going on in Acts chapter 10 and why are tongues present here? That's a good question. All we can kind of do is plug it into the context and say what is going on here that that warrants tongues. Now we've spent three weeks talking about this problem of the Gospel coming to Gentiles. It was not a just a little speed bump in the middle of the road, friends. This was a chasm that had to be got across. We spent three weeks talking about the difficulty with which the Gospel was to go from the Jews to the Gentiles. So now you're in a place to understand why tongues are present here. Are the tongues for the benefit of Cornelius and those who are talking those tongues, speaking those tongues? Or are the tongues for the benefit of the six brethren from Joppa and Peter and the rest of the apostles? You know who is the beneficiary of the tongues? Peter and the rest of the apostles. Friends, tongues are present here because this is the most visible, the most demonstrable, the most public, unimpeachable, unarguable way that God could demonstrate that His Spirit had come to the Gentiles in all of His person, all of His power, and all of His fullness. There's nothing that God could have done here other than this to show to these Gentiles that Jews and Gentiles are brought into the church on the same footing. Why tongues? They are amazed that the Spirit of God is being poured out on Gentiles. And they hear them speaking in tongues, and those six brethren from Joppa are saying to themselves, we saw this before. We we know when this happened. And now the Spirit of God is coming to the Gentiles in the same way, to the same fullness as the Jews. 
and they're convinced. The reason God granted tongues on this occasion is in order that the Jews and the apostles would forever understand the Gospels come to the Gentiles and they're as much of the church as the Jews are. Remember the birth of the church? Remember what happened back then when the Spirit came? Now He demonstrates it again when the Spirit comes to the Gentiles. That's why it was there. They couldn't argue against that. What further proof do you need that God has brought Gentiles into the church as well? This is kind of, if you will, sort of a Gentile Pentecost. I would liken it, and this may not be the best of illustrations, I would liken it to throwing a big rock in a calm pool. In Acts chapter 2, the rock hit the pool, and the waves, the ripples started to go out. As they hit the Gentiles, they experienced the same phenomena. And it's going to happen again in Acts chapter 19 when those ripples hit another group of people. And we'll deal with that when we get to it in a couple of years. Acts chapter 19, when the, when the Spirit of God comes to another unique group of people. What was it? It was languages. Why did it happen? To demonstrate to the Jews and to the apostles and to everybody present, Jew and Gentile are in the church, the same Spirit, the same fullness, the same gift on the same basis. And nobody could argue against that. Because Peter says this is what happened to us back then, and now it's for the Gentiles as well. And they couldn't... What do you do with that? What was it? Languages. Why? To demonstrate to the apostles what's going on, to the Jews what's going on. Is this normal? Should you expect to speak in tongues when you get saved? When you trust in Christ in the middle of a sermon, should you expect to just burst out in a foreign language? Some dialect that you've never known that's not your mother tongue? No. You shouldn't expect that to happen. Why? Because this is not normal. There's nothing in the text, nothing in the context, nothing in anything in the book of Acts that indicates that this was normal. The last time that Peter can recall this happening, he has to go all the way back to what? Pentecost. This is what happened to us, not last week, not last month, not a thousand times since Pentecost. This is what happened to us in the beginning. There's only one other event that Peter can point to and say, this is like that. And it's what? It's Pentecost. Is this a normal thing? Now, our charismatic brethren, they say, look at Acts 2 in the day of Pentecost. Look at Acts 10 with Cornelius. And then you have it happen again in Acts 19. There's tongues all over the place in the early church. You have three occurrences over the course of 30 years. All of them unique historical events. And somehow I'm to expect that this is normal to happen to everybody. It's not normal. Everything Luke indicates to us This is odd. This is out of the ordinary. This was unexpected. They're amazed that this is happening. Because the last time they saw this, Acts chapter 2. People don't speak in tongues every time they get saved. That's not normal. There's nothing normal about this. They look to Acts 2, 8, and 10. They say the leaders of the church spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2. Then you get to chapter 8. Remember with the Samaritans what happened? Philip went and preached Christ. They trusted in Christ. They were baptized, but they never received the Spirit. Until the apostles came down, then they received the Spirit with the laying on of hands of the apostles. And our charismatic brethren say that should be normal. We should expect to be saved, but not receive the Spirit. And then to receive the Spirit later on, at a later time or a later date, evidenced by speaking in tongues. Look at Cornelius. When he got saved, he spoke in tongues. So everybody should speak in tongues when they get saved. The problem with that is there's nothing normal in Acts 8 and 10, and there's nothing consistent. In Acts chapter 8, there is a delay between salvation and the receiving of the Spirit. Why is that? So the apostles can come down and evidence this and be there when it happens. In Acts chapter 10, there's no delay. This happens in the middle of Peter's sermon. The tongues don't even wait until Peter's done preaching and the Spirit comes. In Acts chapter 8, they receive the Spirit by the laying on of hands. There's no hands in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 8, they believe and they're baptized. Then they receive the Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, they believe and receive the Spirit. Then they are baptized. So what's normal? Friends, the only way of understanding this, this is something that is historically unique. And it is by its very nature unduplicatable. Listen. All of these incidences, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, and later on, Acts chapter 19, are all historically unique. You could only have the birth of the church once, as in Acts chapter 2. It happened once, and it can never happen again. 
You can never have the gospel going for the first time to Samaritan believers as in Acts chapter 8. It happened once and it can never happen again. And you can never ever happen, have happen again the gospel come for the first time to Gentiles as in Acts chapter 10. These are all very unique, very different incidences and there's nothing to indicate that any of this should be expected by you and I today. None of it. This is so odd to Peter. He has to go back to Acts chapter 2 and say, what's going on here is just like back there. And he understands why that's happening. Spirit's coming to Gentiles. In a sense, in a way, this is the Gentile Pentecost. They're brought into the church. It's demonstrable for everybody. They can see it's never happened again. It never happened before that. This is unique. This is historic. This is an event of astronomical proportions as the church has now brought in the Gentiles as well. So what happened here? It's languages. It was for the purpose of demonstrating to the Jews and to the apostles what was going on. The Gentiles were part of the church. And is it normative? No, it's not normal. Everything about this is as odd as odd can be. And it shouldn't be expected by you and I to duplicate it. And all of that happened in conjunction with the first result from Peter's sermon, which was belief. There's a second result, and that's baptism. Look at verse 46, the end, the end of the verse. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? Kind of asks a rhetorical question. You might picture him asking it to these six brethren who came with him from Joppa. Anybody here want to refuse water to these guys to be baptized? Who's going to say yes to that? How can you deny that they're saved? That's a good question. How can you deny them water baptism now that they have received all of the substance of salvation? How can you deny them the sign of salvation? After they have received the reality of it, how can we deny them the symbol of it? After they have already received the grace of the covenant, how can we deny them the symbol of the covenant? We can't. You can't deny them now. Now imagine if this had flushed out a little bit differently. Listen, Imagine that Peter had gone to Cornelius' house and he had gotten through his whole sermon. And Cornelius had said, okay, Peter, I believe that. I believe that. I'll trust Christ for my salvation. Now, can I be baptized? Okay, no tongues, no supernatural manifestation. Imagine that it happened that way. And Peter said, well, I guess we could baptize you. And one of these six brethren from Joppa would have tapped Peter on the shoulder and said, Peter, hold on a second. Before you go rushing to baptize these guys, we really don't have any kind of evidence that might suggest that they're really genuinely saved. I mean, after all, they are Gentiles. We are Jews. I know they said they believed in Christ, but I mean, can we really accept them as full members into the body of Christ, into the church, into fellowship with us? I mean, these guys are, are Gentiles, and we're Jews. But the way it fleshed out, Peter can say, can anybody deny them baptism? And the six brethren from Joppa? No. No don't have a single reason to deny these guys baptism. The way it has happened, it is evidence to everybody. These guys are genuinely saved, filled with the Spirit, sealed with the Spirit, members in the body of Christ. And if God has brought these men into communion and fellowship with Himself, then who are we to not bring them into communion and fellowship with us? So look what Peter does. He gives orders to have them baptized. That's significant. Who did he give the orders to? Six brethren from Joppa. Baptize these men. He orders them to be baptized. Why did Peter not baptize them himself? Why did he not baptize them? Do you remember Paul said, I don't baptize? He wrote to the Corinthians and he says, I baptized Stephanus and the household of Gaius and besides that, hardly anybody. I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach Christ. And Paul can count on one hand the people he baptized in that huge church in Corinth. Hardly anybody. Why didn't Peter baptize these believers? Why did he have the six brethren from Joppa baptize them? Why did he order them somebody else to baptize these believers? You know why it is? He wants to involve these Jewish brethren in baptizing these Gentile converts. They've seen it, and far from being able to stand on the sidelines with their hands behind them and watch Peter watch in horror as Peter baptizes these Gentile believers into the church, Peter stands by and he allows them to learn the lesson that he's been learning for the last week. You baptize them. You initiate them into the body. And so they are brought into the body, not by one apostle, but by a group of Jewish believers who now have learned the same lesson that Peter learned. And when Peter gets back to Jerusalem, 
He's going to have six eyewitnesses who help baptize a bunch of Gentile converts with him. And then Cornelius asked Peter to stay for a little bit. Verse 48, he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to stay with him for a few days. Do you think Cornelius had some questions? <laughs> Peter, I've never spoken French in my life. Can you explain to me how it is that I articulated the French in a very dialect? How, how is that? And why can I not speak the language now a couple days later? What went on there, Peter? What is this thing called the Spirit of God? These, these new converts are going to have all kinds of questions. Not just about the tongues. They're going to have all kinds of questions about what it means to be a Christian and how to live the Christian life and who is Jesus. And so Peter does what he's done for basically his whole ministry in Jerusalem. He stayed by and he preached and he taught and he discipled the believers who were in Jerusalem. And then when he was out in Lydda and he led that city to the Lord and then moved to Joppa, he stayed in Joppa for a while. When he went down to Samaria in Acts chapter 8, he stayed there for a period of time, preaching and declaring the Word of God to them. Wherever Peter preached and planted a church, he stayed to disciple those believers for a time. And now he does it with Cornelius. And so these seven once racial Jews hang around and they stay with Cornelius in Cornelius' house. And I can picture Peter there answering questions and meeting with people and establishing that church and incorporating them with the other Jewish believers who were also in Caesarea as the Gentiles are brought into the church. Now listen, this is monumental. What we have is Gentiles now in the church. So we have this wonderful interracial, intercommunity, uh, intercultural, multi-ethnic body of believers all in one big happy family. And everybody is joyous, right? Nope. No, the vision was given to Peter. There are still 11 racist apostles back in Jerusalem that Peter has to face when he gets back there. And we'll look at that next week. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank You that You have brought us into the body of Christ. Thank You for Your grace which was good to us. And we pray, Lord, that You would open to our eyes and our hearts this text to understand Your Word, to understand this incident of tongues and why it is there and why You have chosen to do that. We just thank You, Father, that You have done some phenomenal things in the history of the church and that You continue to do phenomenal things, great things, to demonstrate Your goodness and Your grace to us daily on a daily basis. We are so thankful for Your goodness. We are so thankful for Your grace. And we are thankful for a salvation that reached even to us and brought us up from the pit. For by Your grace You have redeemed us. And we thank You in our Redeemer's name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.